Good evening and welcome. I'm Mike Botchen, the Dean of Biological Sciences in the College of Letters and Science at Berkeley. Together with Jeff Cox, Michael Boots, Jim Hurley, and Diana Bautista, I'm delighted to be here this evening uh, at this uh, virtual series of science talks. I'm uh, a bit old school and really enjoy meeting people in person. But the silver lining to these virtual events is that we can reach more alumni and friends who've moved away from the Bay Area. As you know, uh, in many ways, Berkeley's history can be told as a story of paradigm shifting discoveries. Immuno-oncology and CRISPR genome editing are examples of the type of discoveries that have come out of our division of life sciences. How have we done this? Uh, well, uh, we recruit amazing people. And we are exceptionally good at basic science. Basic science is the theme that runs through our virtual event series this fall. By basic science, we mean fundamental or foundational, not simple, but the basis, the root. I don't think there has been a Nobel Prize in either physical or biological sciences ever where uh, the building blocks of basic science haven't been uh, primary. So tonight, you're going to hear how basic science is an engine of discovery and solutions in health and in health and medicine. And you're going to hear that in, the, in this in the context of a reality altering event that we're all experiencing right now, the COVID-19 pandemic. Often the complexity of questions in basic biomedical research necessitates that we bring together biologists, biochemists, immunologists, and biophysicists. This evening, we're going to hear from four fantastic scientists who will demonstrate this very point to you. Our moderator this evening is Jeff Cox. Uh, Jeff is the CH Lee Chair of Biochemistry and Molecular Endocrinology. He's a professor in our Division of Immunology and Pathogenesis and is the faculty director of the Center and Neglected Diseases, which COVID-19 is. Jeff leads a lab that is trying to understand how mechanisms by which pathogenic bacteria manipulate their host to cause infections. They, fo they focus primarily on tuberculosis, but applying their unique perspective on the molecular mechanisms of host pathogen interactions to a broad range of organisms. Jeff, I'd like to hand the program over to you uh, soon. And, and, and just as one more thought, before we get underway, can you share a bit about your work and how your work is connected to tonight's topic? Jeff? Sure, um, thanks Mike. I'm delighted to be the moderator today. I'm delighted to have so many people here to hear about the really fantastic work that's going on here at Berkeley. In answer to Mike's question, my lab uh, does work on tuberculosis, which uh, is, of course, a, a disease of an infectious bacterium, and um, but is also causes a pandemic, a pandemic that's lasted much longer than COVID-19. But my lab has moved a little bit towards actually studying viruses, and in particular COVID-19. One of the things we've learned about with pathogenic bacteria like TB is that they actually muck around with the immune system and they promote an inappropriate immune system so they can grow. And the way that they do that is they promote an antiviral response. And that's actually bad for bacteria, bacterial infections, bad for us. But we're learning now about how to modulate uh, the immune response in order to promote an antiviral response when we're actually infected with, with a virus. And so we hope to be able to tip that balance uh, in favor of us over the pathogen. And of course, we're thinking about this not only for COVID-19, but also for future uh, pandemics. Uh, the other thing that we're doing along with um, the executive director, Julia Schlatsky of the Center for Emerging and Neglected Disease is uh, we're looking for things that, uh, for small molecules that we can combine with existing antivirals to make them much more potent. And the one thing that we found is that there's an existing drug that you might have heard about, remdesivir, which was first developed um, for hepatitis C virus. And we've been collaborating with biotech companies around the Bay Area to identify small molecules that actually make it work even better. And in particular, against COVID-19. And we've actually found some that's actually really exciting. In fact, 
at UC Berkeley, even though we don't have a, a medical school, I, it's clear that we, we do more uh, work with the virus itself, with the live virus in our biosafety level three labs. And that's really thanks to not only uh, Julia, who's really helped develop that, but also one of my faculty colleagues, Sarah Stanley. And we now have uh, the opportunity to not only look for small molecule screens, looking for small molecules that will help infection, but also to provide the research capacity for other people at Berkeley to work on COVID-19 itself, which is a little bit scary, but absolutely necessary for finding uh, new drugs and new therapies. Uh, uh, for us uh, in my lab, it's been easy for us to, to uh, move our research focus just a little bit from bacteria to, to viruses. But I think that what you'll see from today and what not just from the speakers today, but from other people at, at UC Berkeley is just the amazing number of people, researchers who've nimbly and radically changed their, the direction of the research goals 180 degrees from what they normally study to attacking the existing problem of COVID-19. And I think that you'll see uh, today that these are examples of all three uh, um, um, speakers today. So um, with that, I think I will introduce our first speaker, who is Mike Boots, who is a professor in the Department of Integrative Biology with research interests in the ecology, epidemiology, and evolution of infectious diseases. His lab develops ecological and evolutionary theory, uh, and they test the theory and model systems as well as out in the field. So Mike, uh, welcome, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what you have to tell us today. Thanks, Jeff. Yes, yeah, so my lab is interesting. We build models of the ecology and the evolution of infectious disease. And one of the things that we've been really interested in is why and how some diseases jump between different species and then cause real problems in those new hosts. And this, this happens all the time. This happens in wildlife, in nature all the time, including in these bee viruses that I, that I work on. And as now as we're all very aware, it also happens when diseases jump from wildlife into humans. And we hope that by understanding the basic ecology and evolution of these emergencies, we might be able to manage um, some future outbreaks, maybe predict them better. Okay, so for a while we've been working on bat viruses. Uh, this is Kara Book, who's a Miller Fellow in my lab and she's been looking at viruses in bats in Madagascar in the field for a number of years now that's her holding a bat in Madagascar um, and we think that um, COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 that caused COVID-19 came from bats so, but you know why have we been worried about bat viruses for a while and why have we been studying them so we've been looking at them because there seems to be lots of very virulent nasty diseases that seem to have come from bats so Hendra, Nipah, you might have heard of some of these viruses. And so we recently did a study where we went into the literature and we, we had a look at um, all the different zoonoses, so diseases that jump from mammals into humans. We went and looked to see, you know, how bad they were. And then we sort of looked to see, you know, where they were coming from and whether they were coming from particular mammals or not. And so what I have on this graph here is the results of that analysis. And here we plot the average reported human case fatality. So that's, you know, the proportion of people who die if they get infected from one of these viruses. Along here, we have the kind of phylogenetic distance of so how related these different mammals are to us. So in this corner here, we have the primates or these red dots, and they're very closely related to us, obviously. And we can see they do, there are, have been some viruses have jumped from primates that are highly virulent, but lots of them are not so virulent. And what really stands out to us is these purple dots in this top corner. And these are the bat viruses. So bats are pretty distantly related to us, but we seem to be getting a lot of very virulent diseases from bats. So there does seem to be something that's important about bats and we may need to worry about them more. Um, and we think COVID, as we said, that SARS-CoV-2 causes COVID-19 came from bats. Okay, so we study these in the wild and we um, try and understand what might cause, um, what might, what might um, lead to the being very virulent viruses coming in particular from bats. But what do we know about COVID-19 and what do we know about the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 and why is this potentially a problem if we're going to try and control it? So I'm going to 
tell you a little bit about the transmission here. So what, what we have here is a bunch of data, and these are transmission networks of SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID-19 from Hong Kong in early 2020, in January through to April. And we can see what we have as a whole, these are all individual people who got infected, and this is whether they got infected socially or whether they got infected through the family. And I want you to look at this big cluster here. These are a whole load of people who got infected in one bar. And then we see a lot of people got infected in a wedding at the temple, and then there's some kind of more simple one-to-one um, -one infections. And this is super typical of what we see in, so in, in the transmission of COVID-19, that a few individuals cause lots and lots of, uh, lots and lots of the infections. So some individuals are super spreaders. And this is important because our models will tell us that actually if you have this sort of super spreaded dynamics, so lots, lots of individuals don't infect at all. Some individuals infect a lot of people, places like bars and people are gathering. That actually one thing's good is you get a you get an introduction, there's quite a lot of chance it won't take off. And that's probably what happened early in California in Santa Clara County. But if it does take off, it goes off like a bomb, which is what we saw in New York. So one of our issues is that we have these big super spreading events in SARS COVID-19. COVID that's not uncommon, okay? That also happened in SARS, if you remember, from 2003. Again, lots of infections come from a few individuals. And many of you will have will heard about Typhoid Mary. Again, she was a super spreader. She was a cook. The turn of the century infected lots of people with typhoid. What's really important about Typhoid Mary, and it's also, we think, important in COVID-19, is that she wasn't sick. So she was asymptomatic, but she was still spreading the disease. And that's one of the issues that we have with COVID-19 is we have a lot of people, often young people who can be infected, potentially transmitting the disease and super causing super spreading events, but they don't know that they're sick. And this is one of the big differences compared to what happened with SARS, where basically only people who were sick transmitted the disease. And furthermore, there's another thing about COVID-19 that makes it difficult, is that it has a really short time between when you get infected and when you first transmit, which means a lot of people transmit, a lot of people who would well, well, will become sick, actually transmit before they become sick. They're pre-symptomatic. Again, that's different to SARS. So what happened with SARS is we controlled it. We didn't have a vaccine, but we controlled it by basically isolating sick people. And that was fine, but it doesn't work for COVID-19 because we have these asymptomatics. And not only that, we have people who, is, who are going to transmit before they get sick, these pre-symptomatic transmissions. So how can we control with isolating people and asking people to quarantine? Well, what we need to do is test. And what we need to do is test asymptomatic people and test people who don't know that they're infected yet and are going to get sick. And that's what we've been, we've switched our lab over to helping with over the summer. This is all on the back of the IGI, which is this gene editing um, basic research institute run by Jennifer Doudna. And she switched that lab over to give us a capability to do testing. And then we asked the question, we were asked us the question of, well, will this testing do anything? Can we control the epidemic by testing asymptomatic people? And to do that, we build an ecological epidemiological model go into the detail, can, you can ask me questions about it afterward. But basically we do big simulations and we simulate the spread of the disease on the campus and we assume that individuals are coming onto the campus. And the question is, can we stop the spread of the disease on campus? Okay, so we can use this model, we can look at lots of different scenarios and we can kind of ask that question, can, will testing help, when won't it ha help? You know, what are the most optimal ways in which we can test. Okay, so I'm gonna give you just a couple of, of outputs from this model and a couple of insights we get from this model. One of the first things is actually, if you can control this super spreading that I talked about, you can actually control the epidemic. Here we have a whole load of simulations of the model. These are simulations of epidemics on the campus starting at the start of an epidemic, then what happens through time? These are the number of cases we have. And if we don't do anything, so we don't test, we don't do anything, we get an epidemic, of course. 
But what we can do is if we start limiting the maximum group size anyone hangs out in, so we ask people not to go to big parties, we don't have big classes, you can see that if those group sizes get down to 20 or 16 or 12 or even six, just this on its own is really actually quite effective at stopping the epidemics. One of the key things from the model is that let's just not go in big groups and that will help control the epidemic. What about testing? I'm going to tell you, we did lots of different things, looked at lots of different ways of optimizing it. And one of the key things we found, the importance of turnaround time. What turnaround time is the time between when you test someone and you give them the results. And of course, you can tell them that they're positive and that it would be great if they isolated. And what we show, these are a bunch of outcomes that you get with different turnaround times. And if that turnaround time is 10 days, or five days, you just get epidemics, even four days. But if you can get that, those results back quickly within a day or within two days, we can control the epidemic quite well. And now we're actually, these are the kind of predictions of our model uh, for under our current situation. We have bi-weekly, weekly testing and good control over the group size. So we think the rapid testing is very good at actually stopping epidemics on campus. Um, and this model is useful because it tells us when it can happen, how often we have to test. And I think this is going to become increasingly important because there's all these new technologies coming in which gives us the possibility of doing very many more rapid testing. And that might help us open up businesses more, open up places more before we get some vaccination. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, Mike. That was, that was fascinating. I really want to encourage people to, to ask questions on, on chat. This is your opportunity to ask questions of the experts. Anything uh, goes here. We were hopeful that you'll ask questions about what's going on in, in the world. And um, I actually have a, a question maybe to get us uh, kicked off here, Mike. And that is, what's, what's the deal with bats? I mean, what, why are bats so unique? You know, <laughs> why not, you know, more, you know, non-human primates. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great Let's get question. off the shared screen, yeah. yeah. It's a great question, so I was just trying to do that. That's a great question. So, so the, the thing about bats, so, we, so bats are unique amongst mammals in that they fly, and flying as a mammal is super difficult. So they have these unique immune systems. Bats are unique amongst mammals in lots of ways. And also, they really can't get sick. Because right? if they get sick and they get a little bit of a fever, they're already just on this edge, they're super hot when they're flying and they just die. So we think that these modifications that they have to their immune systems and to their physiology that allows them to fly as a mammal also means that they're able to host these super fast replicating hot viruses and not get sick themselves. And then when these jump into us, normal mammals with our normal kind of immune systems, then they can be much, much more virulent. Sorry, Sorry. Uh, there's a question for the, from the audience, and that is, it, um, you know, what, what is the turnaround time for, for campus testing? And, and, and maybe to put that in, into maybe even a bigger uh, context, right, is that it, it, we've heard in the news that there are some universities, not Berkeley, but other universities where there's been these big parties and also non-universities too, of course, right? But there've been big parties. People have gotten together despite the knowledge that that's not a, the right thing to do. So is, is the rapid testing going to be able to deal with those, those issues? In other words, if, can people have these uh, and can we still, by testing them rapidly, can we catch them and, 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 uh, and block transmission? Yeah, so it's, it's absolutely the case. So in our models, you know, if you're testing rapidly enough, you're testing everybody weekly and you're, getting those, and you're getting those turnaround times quickly, you can potentially stop the epidemic, even if you have these big super spreading events. The problem is you can miss them. And if, you, if you're not testing frequently enough, you miss that, you might well miss that um, super spreading event. And then this epidemic's just got away from you before You've even noticed it's happened. So you need very fast testing. And in some situations, that's what you're going to need to do because you can't stop these um, large group sizes and gatherings. So it's certainly the case. It's a lot easier if you can stop those super spreading events. But very rapid testing is, is well capable of controlling the epidemic, I would say. And actually, the other thing that's really 
important, I think, is that you, the model, the, the tests don't have to be that sensitive. Because actually, if they're not sensitive, they miss individuals with low viral titers. But most of those individuals, because of the skew in the way the virus goes in people, have actually very opposed their peak virus. And so they're actually unlikely to be doing that much transmitting. So as long, the, the key thing is to be rapidly testing and getting those results back quickly. And that's what a bunch of this new technology might help us with. And, and currently Jeff? right now, what is the, yes, Mike. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, answer Mark's question very directly. Uh, the, yeah. it, it's not a simple answer. Uh, the fast IGI uh, saliva testing now uh, that, that uh, Mike Boots described uh, has a turnaround time of, of, of about three to four days. Uh, the University Health Services where they're doing nasal swab is a lot longer. And of course, the, what we're doing with athletes is, uh, is, is uh, much quicker, but outsourced. So it's a complicated question. I hope that was direct enough. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, Michael Botchen, excuse me now, <laughs> Mike Boots. Another question from, from the audience. A group size of 50 suggests schools may still be at risk. Um, and I believe children transmit less efficiently to the, than adults, but or uh, but but they still do transmit. What's your thoughts on schools in the Bay Area being opened with uh, little testing or with the current uh, level of testing that we have now? Yeah, and, a, and they're talking about high schools and grade schools. Yeah, that's a that's a great that's a great question. And I think you know with high school students, I think you know there, there's a lot of transmitting and potentially in elementary school students, it feels that there's you know, there's less, the evidence has been mixed, but what evidence we have suggested that they're much less likely to transmit for anyone. They're less likely to bring it into the home. So I think my sense is that elementary schools is a very different um, situation to high schools. In fact. Um, and I think, you know, you could potentially imagine opening elementary schools with in small bubbles and being careful to control the epidemic. But absolutely, if we have proper testing, then it, that would make it much easier to, to open up more widely. Um, but I think amongst high school students, I think you know, they are transmitting at a high rate. So I think that's going to be more problematic. Thanks, Mike. Actually, a related question from Joe Kennedy. So what, what is the state of the art of um, the testing for the turnaround time? What is the what, sorry? The what, what's the state of the art with respect to the turnaround time? Yeah. Um, the, the, yeah. Okay. I mean, I think IGI Fast is pretty, it's doing a great job with the current, with the saliva test and the PCR. I normally get my test back within a couple of days and that's, that's great and that's fast enough. If you look at some of these antigen tests, they're kind of 15 minute tests, 30 minute tests. Um, so, you know, they're much, much more rapid. A model says you're getting it back in one or two days and in three days, you can still do a good job at, at, at isolating. But much longer than that, it's, it doesn't help you control the epidemic anymore, although it still tells you, you know, what's going on with the epidemic. It's still worth testing, um, but it, does it, do it doesn't help you control it with asymptomatics. These people don't know they're infected the whole time. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. That was really um, interesting and, and relevant. And thank you uh, to the audience for those great questions, and please uh, keep them coming. So uh, now I'd like to turn to our next speaker, who is uh, professor Jim Hurley. He is the Judy C. Webb Chair and Professor of Biochemistry, Biophysics, and Structural Biology. His interests are in membrane and structural biology using high resolution imaging technologies such as x ray crystallography and cryo electron microscopy. Specifically, he focuses on the interplay between proteins and membrane lipids, which are central to some of the inter to all, many of the interactions inside cells, including virus infection. So, Jim, I'm looking forward uh, to your talk and please. Um, uh, and tell us a little bit more about your work. Okay, uh, thanks, Jeff, for the introduction, and thanks for having uh, having me on. I uh, hope everyone can hear me uh, all right. Uh, so I'm a structural biologist, and I've been interested really for quite a while in in uh, virus uh, host interactions by way of our interest in HIV. And uh, a project we've been working on for a few years is to understand how HIV was transmitted from the primate ancestor, uh, SIV, 
how that crossover happened at the structural level. And we worked out uh, an atomic picture of the handle that the virus uses to defeat the host uh, defenses and how that handle had changed over evolution, uh, initially allowing humans to avoid infection, later uh, allowing the virus to cross over. So in March, when shelter in place landed and uh, COVID-19 research really came to the fore, it was a smaller pivot for us than for many to then ask the question, how did uh, SARS-CoV-2 come to be such a dangerous pathogen? What was it that uh, changed in the recent evolution of the virus as compared to its immediate ancestors that makes COVID-19 uh, so bad, while uh, many viruses remained uh, innocuously in, the, in bat hosts, others were transmitted to humans but didn't cause too big of a problem, yet, yet others such as um, SARS in the early 2000s caused significant uh, serious outbreaks but, but still not on the scale of what we're dealing with now. Uh, so we, uh, we began in late March looking at this uh, through the prism of the uh, structure of the viral genome and looking at uh, at what uh, changed. And in this plot, what you're looking at on the y-axis is the similarity at the nucleotide level between uh, SARS-CoV-2 and, and some other related coronaviruses. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to this comparison to one of the hum human SARS-CoV uh, involved in the early 2000s SARS outbreak. And now on the x-axis, you're looking at the nucleotide uh, position in the RNA genome of the virus. And I want to focus your attention on, on this region here because you, you see this spike here. Uh, it indicates a massive degree of sequence divergence. So this is the region of the genome that varies the most between uh, coronaviruses and where SARS-CoV-2 differs the most from uh, SARS-CoV. And this region of RNA uh, encodes the amino acid sequence of a small and uh, mysterious little protein called uh, ORF8. So uh, in, in late March, we decided to turn uh, the attention of uh, at least a couple of people in, in the lab, uh, Tom Flower and Cosmo Buffalo, to uh, look at the atomic structure of, of ORF8 and see what that could tell us. Um, so we do our uh, X-ray imaging through X-ray crystallography at beamlines at the advanced light source. What you're looking at in my uh, Zoom virtual background is a nighttime view, a uh, time-lapse image of the outside of the ALS. And what you see here on the screen is the interior of the ALS. And we were able to use X-ray crystallography to get an atomic uh, image of ORF-8. And, and what this image consists of is electron density, which you see in this uh, chicken wire representation. And th this really gives you a direct uh, look at the quantum mechanical probability clouds of electrons uh, about the atoms in this orphate protein. And we then interpret this electron density with uh, stick models that show us where the various amino acids are. And in this picture, I've zoomed in on the regions that have changed in SARS-CoV-2 compared to uh, SARS. And so this is what we were interested in. And so in the green, I've zoomed in on just that part of the structure uh, that diverges. So we can see uh, atom by atom uh, what, what's changed. So this is one region from really the uh, middle part of the orophate sequence and uh, another region uh, contains a, a sulfur to sulfur staple that connects uh, two molecules and, and binds them tightly together. This is called the disulfide bridge. And this disulfide bridge is also unique to SARS-CoV-2 and, and only present in its most proximate bat ancestor, really absent in the rest of the coronaviruses. So uh, while these are, are not our data and I don't have time to uh, go through it, there are uh, other, other data for epidemiology and immunology that uh, strongly suggest that the role of 
ORF-8 is to help disable uh, and disarm our immune system. And we believe that these atomic structural changes that we've now visualized probably contribute to SARS-CoV-2's uh, ability to disarm our host defenses. And that probably is part of the explanation why uh, this particular pathogen is uh, so dangerous. And so with that, um, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and take questions. Great. Thanks, Jim. Fascinating. Um, so uh, I have I have a couple questions maybe to, to, uh, to get started. And um, first, I, it was really amazing that that one region where there was such a, a big difference there in, I guess the assumption is that there, that that, that is that those differences are important for the disease outcome, right, between SARS-CoV-2 and say like a cold uh, coronavirus. It, it, is, there, is there any evidence to suggest that that, that 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 change is really important in humans? Well, the, uh, there wasn't at the time we started this work. So it, it was a bit of a gamble. And uh, I think in, in a way to address your question, uh, is that a publication came out in The Lancet about a month ago that isolates in Taiwan and Singapore had a, a 382 nucleotide deletion that wiped out most of orf And the virus, the strain of SARS-CoV-2 bearing this deletion does cause disease, but the disease is much milder. It doesn't lead to the uh, hypoxia or to the fatalities that the more uh, prevalent strains uh, lead to. So that's evidence in, in human patients that, you know, that that would be an experiment you obviously couldn't go out and do intentionally, but uh, that's a naturally occurring experiment that I think demonstrates that, that this is involved in the pathogenesis. Great question. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so Jeremy Thorner has a has a question for you. I'm sure you're used to <laughs> Professor Thorner asking you uh, tough questions. <laughs> One of our uh, esteemed colleagues at UC Berkeley, and uh, he's asking a question about well, that ORF A. What what is it doing? It do uh, you know what is the host protein that's interacting with? And his question is, did Nevin Krogan study? Nevin Krogan is a colleague at, at UCSF. Yeah, Nevin Krogan's study came up with 30 or 40 uh, interactors. Uh, many of them are. Uh, e ER proteins, uh, many of them are involved in ERAD, and, and that immediately begs the question, are they actually the receptors that are targeted by the, the protein? And so for, uh, uh, before I get too deep in the expert level uh, answer to Jeremy, uh, I, I should say that, that the, the question is, does this, uh, does this protein, the ORF8, act on the same cell that's been infected by this virus, or is it secreted out of the cell and, and transmitted through the bloodstream to affect many cells? And Nevin's experiment that you're referring to is designed to detect situations where it, where it is working in a, a cell uh, autonomous manner, that is to say working on the same cell. Um, but there, there is other evidence, a paper came out in Nature Immunology also last month demonstrating that um, if you collect antibodies um, from, from people, so if you're doing an antibody test to see is someone seropositive um, to SARS-CoV-2, that seropositivity is probably going to be one of two proteins, and one of those proteins is in fact ORF8, and that suggests that uh, large amounts of ORF8 are being secreted into the bloodstream mm. and develop antibodies. Uh, that is one of the things you are most likely to develop antibodies to. So mm. uh, in my view, I think it's more likely that ORF8 is acting in a cell non-autonomous manner. That, that is infected cells uh, secrete ORF8 and that, then that goes, um, that, that's transmitted on a larger scale and helps uh, deactivate the immune system at a diff at a distance, either in that same cell or uh, a different cell. So then, do, do you think ORF8 then is a good candidate for making a vaccine uh, against? Uh, well, uh, I, I'm afraid um, I, I'm not inclined to think that because it's not presented on the surface of the virus itself. So uh, a vaccine uh, against ORF8 wouldn't uh, actually inactivate, uh, wouldn't detect and inactivate. Um, viruses. Good, uh, a good candidate for a test. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, questions um, more. Uh, let's, um, the, from Evan Ogalas, yet another <laughs> of, of faculty. Um, it seems that the ORP-8 of SARS-CoV-2 dimerizes via that, that staple, that sulfur staple. Um, does the dimerization happen for other ORP-8s from other uh, coronaviruses by some other means, or is this unique? As far as we know, it, it's unique. So the or ORP-8 in uh, SARS-CoV-2 is almost double the size of uh, the other ORF-8. So the uh, coronaviruses mutate through recombination uh, through typically large blocks of sequence being moved around. And this is very different than influenza or HIV, where you have hypermutation and you have point by point uh, tiny mutants happening all over the place. Uh, so what we think happened is that a, a one or two large blocks of new sequence got dropped into the uh, ORF-8 and, and made a massive change really uh, all at once in, in one or probably two events. And, and this cysteine link dimerization is the result of one of those events. And that, that green region that I showed you is probably the result of a second such uh, event. So this is, this is unusual. Uh, I think very distinctive for SARS-CoV-2, and, and that's that's really mm -hmm. what's thought-provoking about it. Um, uh, James Felton has a, a, a related question, and and did that um, did that bridge or that staple did did that evolve in humans? Or where where did these um, sequences uh, so arise? That, so those, those evolved in, in the the most proximal bat uh, ancestor virus. So uh, they th these uh, I think were not. Uh, responsible for the zoonotic tran transmission. I think they happened before, but they likely have something to do with the uh, high degree of pathogenicity of, of, this, uh, of this result. And, and it, another question from the audience is um, the, the drug binding to, to ORP-8, is, is, um, is it a good drug candidate? Uh, like right I, in that region where you're, you highlight? That's an interesting question. So I, I think you know, th there's a lot of hype and a lot of uh, inflated claims about uh, therapies uh, floating around. And I, I don't want to be someone to contribute uh, to that. And, and honestly, I would say if, uh, uh, if I were, uh, say, like a, a mutual friend of ours, Jeff Skip Virgin, an executive of yeah. a company making drugs, <laughs> This is, is not one of the first five or 10 things I would uh, make a drug uh, against, um, not because it's a bad idea, but there are other things that are better ideas. So because coronaviruses don't, don't mutate point by point like flu, thing, uh, elsewhere in the virus are things that are easier to hit and probably will make good pan-coronavirus uh, in inhibitors. But I think this is an interesting thing to study, to uh, understand the pathogenesis, to understand the immune response. And, and I do think that if you uh, did develop a, a blocker of this, yes, it, it probably would help. It, it's not the first place I would put precious resources, but I think it would in fact help. Okay, well, good to, good to know. Thanks, Jim. That was really, really fascinating. Okay, um, and thanks for all the great questions again. Um, now, uh, we'd like to move on uh, to our final speaker, who is uh, Diana Bautista. She's the Class of 1943 Memorial Chair and Professor of Cell and Developmental Biology. Her interests include understanding mechanisms underlying the sensations of, of itch. She's a neurobiologist. The touch and, and pain as well. And also, and which is relevant for today's uh, talk, is that she's been studying this fascinating interaction between the nervous system and, and the immune system, something which I think many people don't really understand, or especially out of the public, that, that they are, are connected. And so I'm really excited to hear what Diana's, Diana has to say today. And so, Diana, um, the, the floor is yours, and I look forward to, to your talk. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jeff. And let's see if I can share my screen. All right, great. Well, I'm really excited to be here tonight to tell you about some of the recent projects that my lab has undertaken to understand the neuroimmune interactions triggered by COVID-2 infection, and also aimed at understanding how viral infection triggers the nervous system to promote airway uh, respiratory distress. 
So while, as Jeff mentioned, while it's well accepted that the immune system plays a really key role in respiratory diseases, many people don't know that the nervous system is also a key leader of the airways in both health and disease. Um, and, and these neurons are, um, that innervate the lung that are free nerve endings um, schematized here, we have several different classes of these neurons that regulate a variety of um, normal lung behaviors, including breathing, um, things like coughing, um, uh, sneezing in the nose, and, and also they contribute to inflammation under conditions of infection or disease like asthma. Now, our lungs are very densely innervated by these sensory free nerve endings. And if we take a look here um, at this movie, that is a 3D image of human lung that are stained in red for alveoli in, and in blue and green are the free nerve endings. And you can see that there's a really dense network, um, almost like a mesh. And these neurons are in close opposition with um, the airway cells, epithelial cells, as well as the vasculature. And we can take a closer look at this fixed image from a mouse lung. And if we zoom in at one of these alveoli, what you can see is that these nerve endings wrap physically around the epithelial cells. And there's a synergistic interaction between these cells under normal conditions that help them function and regulate breathing and inflammatory responses under normal conditions. So my lab has been really focusing on the interaction between three key cell types in airway inflammation. The airway epithelial cells that we see here, um, the sensory nerve endings and nerve fibers that innervate and interact, and also immune cells that um, can come in in response to neuronal activation. Uh, these neurons can regulate the vasculature, uh, recruit different classes of immune cells, and even promote immune cells to release inflammatory mediators. And in turn, these epithelial cells and immune cells can also release mediators that change the activity of the neurons, making them hyperexcitable and alter breathing rates, um, and in some cases cause really severe respiratory distress and um, a block of breathing altogether. My lab has really been focused on understanding ion channels, which are membrane proteins that allow the passage of ions across the membrane. And in all three of these cell types, the influx of cations through these ion channels are really important in triggering electrical signals because we know that for the nervous system to be activated and to trigger these responses, you need these electrical signals. And also calcium passage across the, the membrane into the cell is a key trigger in um, all three cell types that really regulates the release of inflammatory cytokines that can contribute to inflammation. And we've identified a number of key ion channels in these cell types that play key roles in inflammation related to um, chronic itch like eczema, chronic pain conditions associated with chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, and also in, in the airways. And what got us interested in studying coronaviruses and SARS-CoV-2 infection, in addition to this hyperexcitability of the nervous system that we think is playing a key role in airway inflammation, um, the other thing that got us interested was that human, all human coronaviruses, including SARS-CoV-2, express viral ion channels in the infected cells to create a favorable replication environment. And we've really been focused on studying two ion channels in particular, uh, the 3A ion channel and the E ion channel, because they're some of the most highly expressed proteins by viruses in infected cells. But these, these ion channels are not found in the membranes of the virus or the virus capsid, but instead they're inserted into the infected cell membrane and trigger changes in excitability and calcium homeostasis. And in animal studies, these ion channels have been shown to be really important in creating a favorable environment that allows the virus to replicate and spread from cell to cell. We think this is a very important process to study, but these, these ion channels have been um, are really understudied. There's, there's not that many um, 
scientific studies looking at their function and how they affect airway physiology. And we think that they're really tipping the balance um, in these interactions between neurons cells and epithelial cells, static state to this hyperinflammation um, that we've all been hearing about in the airways. So we're addressing several, uh, we have several projects addressing key questions that are unanswered in SARS-CoV-2 infection. And the first is to understand how these viral ion channels alter epithelial cell physiology. And we've been able to develop assays uh, where we could monitor um, calcium signaling and ion channel function in airway epithelial cells in uh, the absence and presence of virus and ion channels. Um, and you could see here in this movie, normally happy epithelial cells are, um, have very low calcium, but using this fluorescent dye, we could see when they become overactivated and you get this big change in cytosol calcium, which causes the release of all kinds of inflammatory mediators that you don't want to have um, being secreted. We are also interested in asking if these sensory neurons are directly infected by SARS-CoV-2. And recent um, human studies have shown that the human sensory neurons that innervate the airways uh, have all of the machinery needed for the virus to enter the cell and express these ion channels and alter electrical signaling in neurons, but this has not been directly tested yet. And we've already worked in the past with um, human primary neurons isolated from donors, and we're very eager to um, ask this question, as well as understanding how infection of these neurons or changes in neuronal activity due to epithelial cell infection causes changes in excitability. And we've been able to record from um, the cell bodies of the neurons that innervate the lung, as well as primary afferents in response to inflammatory mediators like lipids that are associated with COVID-19 uh, respiratory distress and have um, some interesting candidate molecules in the neurons that might block these hyperexcitable signals that um, we're seeing. And finally, we've been screening for drugs that inhibit specifically these viral ion channels in human cells. And in the past, they've been a little bit tricky to study in um, cell lines because they, they uh, don't express well. And in some cases, in, they behave differently in um, the standard cell lines that people often use to study uh, viral infection and replication assays. So we've developed a fluorescent-based assay where we could take advantage of the fact that these ion channels, um, both 3A and E viral ion channels, pass large cations, and we could use a fluorescent, uh, fluorescently labeled ions and look at how much of this fluorescence builds up in cells. And we've been doing high throughput screening to identify um, FDA approved drugs and other ion, known ion channel blockers to try to find specific ways to inhibit these ion channels when they are in human cells. And um, Sonali Mali in my lab, uh, who's a PhD candidate, has screened many, many compounds and found some really interesting blockers that seem to be really specific for blocking, um, in this example I'm showing you, uh, the activity of the 3A channel in the absence of a blocker and in the presence of a blocker um, that we recently identified and think that these types of large-scale screens may lead to um, some really important diagnostic tools that we could use in animal models to probe how blocking these channels affect viral infection, but also perhaps may lead to um, drug discovery for therapeutics. So overall, our studies will provide novel mechanistic insight into the role of the nervous system in SARS-CoV-2 mediated respiratory distress. We think that this, um, again, we don't really know much about what the nervous system is doing in the case of infection, but looking at other inflammatory diseases that we looked at, we know that these neurons under normal conditions play a very important role in regulating breathing and inflammatory responses and think they're key players here. And we also hope to identify new drug targets that can inhibit airway inflammation due to SARS-CoV-2 infection. Thanks. Thanks, Diana. That was amazing. 
uh, just uh, right off the top of my head, I, I just wonder I mean, what are these ion channels doing in, in, in for the for the virus? I mean, obviously they're they're likely involved in infl inflammation and maybe provoking too much inflammation, which we've heard heard about, like in cytokine storm situations, right? That really make people sick. But uh, do, do you think that that's the reason why these have evolved, or do you think that that it's doing something else for the virus inside these infected cells? Yeah, um, so I think there's multiple possibilities there. And one thing that is important is that we see that these proteins are um, also in intracellular organelles and that different calcium levels can not only affect secretion, but also protein trafficking. And so part of it might be um, creating this really rich environment for the virus to replicate. In addition, um, elevated calcium can also trigger cell death. And that might also be a way for um, the virus to spread as eventually the cells die and release the virus and spreads from cell to cell. Have you taken your small molecule and, and put it on cells that are infected and see what happens to them yet? Um, we have not. This is very fresh data. <laughs> so. Ooh, let's talk after. We can talk. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Send can help with that. <laughs> I would love that. Yeah, great. We're, we're fighting COVID as we speak. <laughs> um, oh, I, I had another question uh, that came up um, while we wait for audience questions. Um, is that we've heard a lot about in the news about the about certain neuropathies, right? That that people get when they have COVID nineteen, they recover from the virus, but then they have these long standing. Some of them are, are neurological defects. I wonder if there's anything related to to this um, with. Uh, what, what's your what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, it's a really interesting question. So we've been in my lab, we've looked, we study pain as well, and we've been looking at mechanisms underlying neuropathic pain and trying to define neuroimmune interactions that drive these different neuropathic pain states, which could include pain hypersensitivity, but also loss of sensation or tingling and numbing that you hear quite a bit about um, from these long-term studies post um, initial infection. And we think that the same types of neurons and molecules that are mediating inflammation in the lung may be also triggering this neuropathic disease-like state in some of the uh, infected patients. And we know that in our studies where we've looked at skin inflammation or pain in the periphery, a lot of the same molecules that turn on under inflammatory conditions that drive chronic pain also are involved in triggering asthma in the airways. So there's a lot of conservation in the types of neurons involved in these two types of inflammatory diseases and the inflammatory mediators that drive them. Um, so perhaps some of the things that we've discovered in our pain studies and inflammatory pain um, studies may be also applicable to um, to this new type of neuropathic pain and neuropathies that we're seeing. Yeah, yeah, that's that's cool. Um, uh, Ava has a question. How conserved are these channels? Will these potential drugs help with future coronaviruses? Yeah, so these channels are highly conserved. They're expressed by all of the human coronaviruses and many of the others. And um, so we think that it's maybe not just relevant to SARS-CoV-2, and most of the studies were done on SARS-CoV-2. Um, so we think that they're used by all coronaviruses that express them perhaps as a way to, to spread and replicate. Okay, one, one last question from, from Jeremy. Are these, uh, both those channels, are they open all the time? Do they let those ions go back and forth all the time or do they open and close under certain conditions? Yeah. Because maybe that's a way to, to, to block them, right? Instead of just plugging the hole, you can, you can make them so that they're always closed or something like that. Yeah, and we're doing an unbiased screen. So we're open to any type of mechanism that blocks channel function, whether it's plug, plugging the pore or blocking the gate. We really don't know how they're regulated um, we see that in, in the cells that we've looked at, that so far E looks like it's very open all the time, um, and that 3A is not open all the time. It's given us a lot of trouble, and it has a low open probability. And we're really excited to see if, like other non-selective cation channels, perhaps they're regulated by inflammatory mediators, 
um, reactive oxygen species, other things, proteases that we know regulate other ion channels that have similar um, function and permeabilities and you know, are perhaps modulated by things that the virus is also triggering um, to be released by infected cells. Okay, well, um, thanks, Diana, and uh, thanks to um, all the speakers for really uh, fascinating uh, talks. Uh, thank you, too, uh, to the audience for your uh, great questions and your attention. It's been my pleasure to moderate uh, you through this. And um, if you have any other questions, um, please feel free to contact us. Um, and also, I wanted to, one, one last thing I want to mention is that Diana is actually, who the speaker you just met, uh, is actually going to be on NPR on Friday, on Science Friday. So this um, on the 2nd of October um, from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time or 11 to 1 um, uh, Pacific Time. And it's perhaps not completely COVID related, but you'll get a chance to hear about her other work, especially on itching. So um, with that, I'll, I'll uh, again, thank you very much for your attention and I'll turn it back over to Mike. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, this is really sustaining for me and I hope for uh, all of us. Uh, thanks to uh, Mike Boots, Jim Hurley and Diana for sharing uh, your work with us and giving, giving us all a unique glimpse into the COVID-19 research on campus. As a dean and a scientist, uh, I, I always enjoy uh, hearing our faculty convey their own excitement about their research. It's contagious, forgive the pun, uh, and a reminder of the excellence that we have at Berkeley. Uh, but as a person right now living through this extraordinary time, it encourages me. And again, to repeat that word, it's sustaining for all of us just to see how remarkable uh, our Berkeley faculty are and how nimble they are to uh, actually change course and do this kind of research for the greater good and for basic discovery. Uh, I also want to take a special thanks again to our alumni and friends for gathering here tonight. And I feel very strongly that while it's essential to hunt for drug targets and better therapeutics, uh, again, uh, I may be preaching to the converted here, but all of this uh, therapeutic stuff and drug research go hand in hand with foundational work that leads to these solutions. Basic science has always been uh, Berkeley's greatest strength and must continue to be so. Your support, your philanthropy, and your adv advocacy for Berkeley means everything to us and to the faculty, uh, like Mike, Jim, and Diana, and their incredible students and postdocs. We're grateful for your continued interest in Berkeley as alma mater to many of you and the fantastic work being done here. If there's anything you want to learn, again, more about, or if you'd like to support our work for which there's a deep need, I'm sure you're all understanding of that, please be in touch with us. We absolutely want to be part of advancing basic science and discovery at Berkeley. We want you to be involved with us in this quest. With that, fiat lux, and uh, see you soon, I hope. Bye. <laughs>